Welcome to Dornsife Dialogues. Our conversation today is in collaboration with our Center for the Political Future, our own go-to source for civil fact-based debate on substantive issues. I always look forward to these events, especially when there is an election around the corner. And exactly four weeks from today, we have our November 2022 midterm elections. So we're here to learn from our experts how this cycle is shaping up. We all know that midterms traditionally serve as a referendum on the direction of the country. And that seems especially true of this cycle. While both parties are searching for their identity, the issues we are facing together are growing increasingly urgent and personal. Just about everyone has felt the effects of inflation, the climate crisis, a war in Europe, and questions of legitimacy in our democratic process. Who will be in the driver's seat on these issues, and a whole lot more, is on the line in November. And our terrific panel is here today to unpack some of the most pressing questions from a variety of angles. Our conversation will be moderated by Bob Shrum, one of the co-directors of our Center for the Political Future, whose leadership has positioned USC Dornsite as a national leader in practical politics. Bob is the Carmen and Lewis Warshaw Chair in Practical Politics. He is among the most sought after democratic political strategists in the nation, with an unparalleled record of consulting for high level campaigns and administrations. He will introduce our panelists. Thank you again for joining us and for supporting our Center for the Political Future. Bob, take it away. Dean Miller, thank you for that generous introduction for your extraordinary leadership and support for the work the center is doing. Uh, I am, as uh, Dean Miller just said, the Warshaw Professor, Director of the Center for the Political Future here at UC USC Dornsife. Uh, and in addition, you've already been told this to our session today on platforms like Zoom and Facebook. This conversation will become part of our Bully Pulpit podcast and will be available on YouTube, on our Facebook page, uh, on a variety of sources. So let me introduce our guests. Stephanie Cutter is the founding partner of Precision, a leading strategy firm in Washington, D.C. in New York City. She was the chief program executive for the first ever virtual Democratic convention in, in 2020, which the Washington Post called worthy of any consideration. She was also the executive producer of President Biden's inauguration, reimagining how to showcase an historic moment a traditional moment in the midst of a pandemic and after the events of January 6th. She previously served as deputy campaign manager for President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, and I had the privilege of working with her both when she was Senator Ted Kennedy's press secretary and when she was press secretary for John Kerry in the 2004 campaign. Jessica Milan Patterson is the first woman, the first Latina, and the first millennial to chair the California Republican Party. She has boosted both the party's fundraising and its total voter registration by over 600,000. Before this, she was the CEO and co-founder of California Trailblazers, which recruits and trains Republican candidates to run for state legislative office. She has had leadership positions with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, and Senator John McCain. I'm gonna start with, uh, by the way, uh, we're going to talk for about 40 minutes and then turn this over to questions from you. So put your questions into the Q&A and then I'll ask them when we have 15 or 20 minutes left. Let me start with a kind of general question. A month out from the midterms, how are each of you feeling about the campaign and why? And I'll start with Jessica. I'm pretty good. Um, you know, we have been working incredibly hard over the last several years to build upon the successes that we had in 2020. Um, when all of the prognosticators and, and um, analysts were going into the 2020 election on the House side, uh, they said that we were going to lose 15 seats. So they got the number right, they got the party wrong. And here in California, a uh, very deep blue California, we played in four races, we won all four of those races. And um, we sent more new Republicans to the House of Representatives than any other state in the nation. Following redistricting, um, this is, you know, once every 10 years, we get this opportunity. And the wins that we have, the battles that we fight in, in this cycle, uh, could dictate what it looks like for the next decade. Right now, the issues are falling on our side. Um, when we're talking about inflation, when we're talking about rising crime, 
when we're talking about um, education, when we're talking about homelessness here in California, these are all issues that California Democrats have failed on. Um, it gives us a, a lot of opportunities throughout the state. So right now, I feel pretty good. Uh, I assume that you have a different perspective, Stephanie, and that it's not just about California, but about the country. You're you're, muted. you're muted, Steph. Sorry about that. Um, it's a slightly different perspective, but there are some fundamentals um, in midterm elections that carry through for every party, every president. You know, this is the President Obama, um, most of Obama, President Biden's um, first midterm election. Um, and at this point in a presidency, um, the midterms are typically a referendum on that president. Uh, it, was, it, it was for President Trump in 2018. It certainly was for President Obama in 2010 and so on. In fact, in recent memory, the only time when the ruling party in the White House didn't lose seats um, in a midterm election was in 2002 after 9-11, uh, where the country was very much unified. And in 1998, after President Clinton's impeachment, where independents just threw up their hands, they were done uh, with the Republican Party over uh, impeachment. So, uh, you know, we come into this midterm understanding that Democrats are likely going to lose seats. Um, and uh, but I think over the past year, uh, Democrats have been successful in preventing this from being a referendum on President Biden. It's very much, um, you know, there are two people at the top of each ticket, depending upon which race you're talking about. And President Trump has continued to play a presence um, in the American political um, uh, narrative and conversation for a variety of reasons, both through his own doing, uh, getting on the campaign trail, endorsing candidates, but also what's happening with the investigation over January 6th, what's happening over the investigation on his keeping um, highly uh, confidential documents um, and just in injecting himself into the national discourse. Um, the other thing that has changed the course of this election um, is the Dobbs decision on abortion, uh, where it, uh, it made people wake up to realize the, the important issues that are, are on the ballot. Um, and, um, and the fact that Republicans want to pass a national ban on abortion really helped codify the choice um, in this election. Now, you know, since Labor Day, I will say that that momentum for Democrats has started to wane just a bit. We're in the final stretches of this campaign um, you know, the I would say that more likely than not, uh, the odds are with Republicans to take back the House. Um, on the Senate, it really is a 50-50 um, gamble of who is going to take control of the Senate. Um, so, you know, we're in the final stretches. It's incredibly uh, tight and competitive. Um, it's not typical for um, uh races that are toss-ups to break a number of different ways, they usually break all together. So this is the, the final moments where everything that happens now will, will make a difference. So um, we'll see. Okay, let me, let me follow up on that, on both of you actually. Uh, listening the, to the two of you, there seem to be two competing potential waves here that could maybe make this different than most midterms. On the one side, you have the normal dissatisfaction with the president facing the first election of his first term, in particular, in this case, voter reaction to inflation, higher gas prices, and if the GOP has its way, crime and immigration. On the other side, and Stephanie, you referred to this, you have what appears to be an intense reaction to the reversal of Roe v. Wade, and increasingly in the polls, to what many voters see as a rising threat to our democracy. So first to you, Stephanie, how do you believe these two competing waves will play out? And do you anticipate an increase in turnout, especially among women and younger voters? I mean, how it's gonna play out, um, you, can see, you can see this starting to gel in some races. Um, and you know, if you take uh, Wisconsin, for example, um, where uh, the issue of crime has been used as a cudgel, in the Senate race um, by Ron Johnson against Mandela Barnes. 
Um, and there are, you know, lots of things happening in that race. There are some racial components with some of these attacks that Johnson is making on Mandela Barnes. But the issue of crime um, is proving salient. Barnes was, you know, coming out of Labor Day, Barnes was seven, eight points ahead. Um, they are statistically tied right now, but the numbers on Barnes of people, the number of people who think he's an extreme candidate have skyrocketed. Um, so that's a salient issue where abortion in that state is not as strong as say in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, so it is right now a, a state by state balance on um, you know, the swing of that pendulum between those two waves. Where it ends up on election day, it, you know, it typically waves impact um, house races more than Senate campaigns, which are very much about the quality of the campaign and the candidate. Um, so I would suspect in house races that um, the, the, you know, not so much crime, but the issue of uh, inflation and the economy, um, that's something that people are living every day. Uh, and while Democrats can make arguments about, um, you know, there's one party taking action to reduce your costs um, versus another party who wants to overturn those programs. Um, and uh, start e increasing your costs on prescription drugs, energy, uh, healthcare. Um, you know, people's lived experiences are gonna make a big difference. So when they go to fill up their gas tank, when they go to get groceries at the grocery store, um, that likely will be front of mind um, for most voters. But again, yeah. in, in, in house races, in Senate races, there's a different calculation. These are statewide races, um, there are, um, you know, a number of different issues in these Senate races in terms of the quality of candidates, um, especially, you know, in Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, um, where that's really going to matter um, in, the, in the final say. So that's where you think you may see more women turning out in the suburbs and having a bigger impact. Yeah. Uh, Jessica, uh, can you take a crack at that and also tell us how your Republican candidates in pro-choice California are handling the issue of abortion and the Dobbs decision. Yeah, I think certainly Democrats all over the country would like it to be about um, abortion and maybe some other national issues, but you know we're just not seeing that. Um, we're not seeing that, that having an impact. Um, and here in California, where even if Prop 1 failed, um, nothing would change when it comes to uh, the availability of choice here in California for women. So, um, you know, when we look at the you know, eight or so Senate races across the country, uh, with the exception of one, which is New Hampshire, I think all of them are within four points either way. And um, right now we're seeing a lot of the Republican candidates that are in, moving in the right direction. Uh, they've closed the gap in some of these places where they were underwater. And so right now, uh, at this snapshot in time, I feel good about it. Um, and I think that they have a momentum that's exciting to watch. And I think continuing to talk about those kitchen table issues is what's going to lead those candidates to success. Um, but many of them are in the margin of error. And um, like I said, four points either way, um, these are going to be tough races, and I think everyone that says it's a 50-50 shot right now on who ends up with control of the Senate is right. Um, these are going to be very close races, and we're going to see them play out. Here in California, um, what's most important when I'm recruiting and, and looking for candidates is authenticity. Um, they have to be authentic to who they are. In my opinion, voters see right through you when you say the things that you think they want to hear, and particularly when you say multiple things that people want to hear. Um, so when it comes to uh, the abortion issue, um, I think it's important for candidates to be authentic to who they are, um, if they are pro-life without restrictions, if they are pro-life with restrictions, if they are pro-choice. I think it's important for them to be who they are. And I, as a state party chair, I don't have a litmus test. Um, my job is, as California Republican Party chair is to grow our organizations. And so I'm a big tent Republican. And while my personal views may be incredibly conservative, I think there's room for anyone who wants to identify as a Republican. Um, so authenticity, I think, is number one. I think it's important to know who you are and stand up for those positions. And then, again, move back to the issues that California voters care about. 
Um, and right now we're seeing it in poll after poll. Um, what are those issues? The issues that are most important to people are the economic issues. It's homelessness, it's rising crime, and it's education. Uh, so I want to follow up on, on what both of you have talked about in terms of the Senate. Uh, the Republican Senate leader, Mitch McConnell, has complained about what he calls candidate quality on the GOP side in Senate races. He hasn't been specific about who he's talking about, but I can think of Herschel Walker in Georgia, Dr. Oz in, in New Jersey, Don Boldick in New Hampshire. Uh, Jessica, how much does this matter? Aren't Senate races different than House races and sort of outside any potential way? And as a result, don't Democrats have a better chance of controlling the Senate than they would in a normal midterm? So I think candidate recruitment is important. Stephanie mentioned it in the beginning. There's a certain historical perspective that we have to have on all of these races, right? We know we're in a midterm election. What does that mean for the party out of power? What does it mean for the party in power? But I'm a big believer in candidate recruitment, and that's why I worked on an organization uh, that focused on candidate recruitment. And I learned, you know, from, in my opinion, the best of the business, which is Leader McCarthy. And um, there is no one that spends more time out in communities all over the country learning about who are the best people to represent these districts. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and now I do it on the legislative side with our legislative leaders here in California. And so I think that there's a responsibility there when you are in leadership to go out and find the right candidates um, that can not only win in a general election, but that can win in a primary election, um, that can do what's ne what needs to be done. Um, that means spending the time, raising the money. It means focusing on data and making sure that you're right on the issues and you fit those states and those districts. Um, so I think that the recruitment has to come um, from a partnership at the top. And um, I think that, you know, when you're out there looking for candidates, you have to find candidates that can both win in a general and also a primary. Uh, Stephanie, what do you think the impact is of the Herschel Walker candidacy in Georgia, Dr. Oz in New Jersey? Don Boldick in, in New Hampshire. Is this going to matter? Yes, it's going to matter. Um, I think, um, let's take one by one. Um, in uh, Baldick um, in New Hampshire, I think that uh, for Democrats, we feel pretty um, good um, about Maggie Hassan's chances in re-election of that camp of, of for Senate. Uh, she's outside the margin of error. I think that um, uh, his comment about abortion, that we just have to get over it, um, really crystallized uh, for many people in New Hampshire um, who they wanted to send to the Senate and who they didn't, um, who was going to look out for them and who wouldn't. Um, then you go to Pennsylvania, um, and that race has tightened and it will tighten further for sure. It is, as you know, still Pennsylvania. Um, so there's, you know, basically three states within one um, there. And, uh, you know, that race um, has been pretty much defined by Dr. Oz's celebrity and his out of touchness with Pennsylvanians and doesn't even live in the state, uh, his ties to Donald Trump, et cetera. Um, as it tightens, um, you know, I think he has professionalized his campaign, um, as you don't see him as much <laughs> anymore. Um, you know, there's no more crazy videos of him going to sh going shopping for uh, fancy vegetables in uh, a state like Pennsylvania. Um, and, uh, and they've gotten smarter about the attacks on Fetterman. Um, that's another state where they're using crime um, to their advantage. Uh, but at the same time, when you put these two side by side, Fetterman is just the better candidate and knows that state better, uh, which makes a difference. And as Jessica said, the authenticity behind a candidate is really important. And you can't create that. That is what it is. And uh, I think you do get a, a real sense of authenticity. You may not agree with everything, um, but he is authentic and he knows that state, John Fetterman. Um, and then you get to uh, uh, Georgia, um, which is the craziest of them all. Um, and, uh, it is a tight race. Uh, Warnock is ahead, uh, over Herschel Walker. 
Um, uh, Warnock is, is, you know, obviously very authentic for that state. He's a minister. Um, he uh, is smart about um, his politics there. And, you know, he's, he fits the state. Um, Herschel Walker, um, you know, was a hand-selected candidate um, uh, by Donald Trump, but also Mitch McConnell. Um, and uh, he um, has run into problem after problem. Most recently, uh, you know, a woman coming out of the woodwork saying that, uh, you know, he asked her to get an abortion and paid for it. Um, he denied it. Turns out she already had a kid with him um, after he said he didn't even know her. Um, and and he's running as a um, basically a you know God fearing evangelical uh, Christian um, who doesn't believe in abortion. Um, and does that matter for the Republican base in that state? Probably not. They have solidified behind him, um, and you know are more interested in the power of the seat than the person in the seat. Um, but does it matter for? swing voters um, to those independents um, uh, around Atlanta, suburban women, um, and even uh, whether or not he can shave off any of the black vote from Warnock. Those are the margins that really do matter um, for uh, the, the craziness in that race. And the quality of the candidate will matter for those margins. So uh, Stephanie, you've mentioned several times Donald Trump and uh, his role in the midterms. Can you talk in more depth about his impact on this campaign? And then tell me whether or not we're gonna see President Biden out there campaigning for Democrats. You know, I think um, Trump has an uh, impact in two ways. One, he does rally the Republican base. Um, he's still very popular uh, with that Republican base, um, but he also rallies the Democratic base um, and also makes those, um, independent women, many of whom would choose to stay home in a, in a midterm election, um, come out and vote. Um, and um, that's why I think you see him come out selectively um, for certain races at certain times. And um, the party writ large has tried to keep him at bay um, uh, in this midterm. Um, that's worked at some points better than others. Um, but again, the, you know, the national events are happening both on the January, January 6th committee, the, um, the raid of his, of Mar-a-Lago home by the FBI, those things do keep him in the headlines. Um, and, and that does matter. And again, it's, yeah. we're talking here in a midterm, we're talking about margins, right? Um, will, will Trump rally the Republican base? Probably. Will Trump get more Democrats to come out? Probably. Will he affect uh, independent women? Probably. But again, it's, uh, these are small margins that we're talking about in a very, very tight race generally. What about Biden? Biden will hit the campaign trail. Um, uh, he's doing a lot of fundraising. Um, you know, I'm pretty certain that you're going to see him out without revealing anything that he's that he will be hitting the campaign trail. He's obviously had a lot on his plate uh, with the G7 um, and uh, other issues, um, but uh, you'll see him. You know, I think he faces the, the same problems that every midterm president faces, that in these tight races um, in, uh, in, you know, purplish states, uh, they don't, Democrats uh, that are up for re-election or, or running for re-election don't want to be reminded, um, don't want voters to be reminded that they are attached to a national party. So if the president comes into your state, he comes into your district, that's a big reminder um, that you're tied to a national party and, you know, that some of your independence that you've been campaigning on might not stand up. So I think yeah. a lot of that in these tight races. Yeah, I think it's a kind of bipartisan problem in the sense that, uh, for example, there was a New York Times story about J.D. Vance not particularly wanting Donald Trump to come to Ohio. Trump announced he was coming to Ohio. And then in a rally where he was supposedly campaigning uh, for J.D. Vance, he ridiculed him. Uh, but 
you know, I, I, both of them, I think, have certain problems. And the question is whether or not you use them in the right way. Mitch McConnell, Jessica, certainly wishes that, uh, and I think Kevin McCarthy does too, that Donald Trump would stop talking about 2020 and talk about the issues of 2022. Now, I don't suspect that we'll see him campaigning here in California, but does he have an impact on your candidates and on the races? Oh, certainly. Um, we saw in 2021 with the recall election, um, 2 million people that voted for President Trump in 2020 didn't show up for the recall in 2021. Um, there's definitely a group of people that were excited by the president and um, were driven to go out and vote because of him. Um, so he definitely has an impact here. We also won, you know, four seats in California in 2020 that President Trump lost all four of them, and some of them by double digits. And um, so our work will always be to focus on what's happening here in California. In fact, when um, we talk about some of these Senate races, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania are two really good examples of it. Um, because crime is such an issue that's resonating with people, oftentimes they are pointing to California and um, what has happened here because of soft on crime policies, whether it's Prop 47 or Prop 57, AB 109, um, woke DAs that are not prosecuting, um, releasing criminals out onto our street, um, decriminalizing everything here. Um, many states and many uh, Senate races point to California, Democrat-run cities here in California. Um, so I think that you're going to continue to see that. Our job is always going to be here to focus on the issues that are most important to people, and those are the local issues and you know legislative issues that are affecting their everyday way of life. Uh Stephanie, can you respond on the crime issue? And by the way, does it make much difference how Democrats respond? Respond to... You know, to what Jessica was saying about crime. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, is, is the issue that are Democrats soft on crime? Democrats aren't soft on crime. Um, you know, from a national perspective, uh, if you... Uh, you know, the, the money that uh, communities are using right now to hire and train police, Democratic communities, Republican communities, is the result of President Biden's rescue plan, um, which every Republican voted against. So that's a Democratic president with a Democratic House and Senate sending money to communities to strengthen their law enforcement. Um, the, the second issue, the, you know, passing uh, gun reform, much of the crime that you see is an increase in, in gun crimes. Um, and, uh, you know, you have a president who helped forge the first bipartisan, slightly bipartisan um, gun uh, reform law, first one in 30 years, um, to, uh, to strengthen our background check system, um, which by and large Republicans are running against. Um, so there is a disconnect between what Republicans are, are running on in their campaigns on crime versus uh, what they have done on crime. Um, they have very successfully uh, painted uh, Democrats, and we saw this in 2020, um, that you know uh, all of the um, analysts and um, uh, projections were um, Democrats were going to pick up tons of House seats, and we had all these projections for the Senate. Uh, to take back the Senate. It didn't happen, um, largely because of uh, the defunding police argument. It, that was one of the major reasons. Um, and it's simply just not the case. There's not a Democrat running um, that wants to defund the police. Um, and But it's, they have very successfully used that on the campaign trail to paint Democrats as soft on crime. So there's a disconnect between the reality of policies versus um, the, you know, the tactics on the campaign trail. Well, you know, and I would argue that what matters is what people perceive, not what legislation actually does. And I would add that in my view, and I wrote a lot of slogans over time, as you know, defund the police belongs in the hall of fame of the dumbest political slogans of all time. Uh, I, I'd like to move a little bit beyond the election because it's going to have some consequences and start with Jessica. If Republicans capture at least the House of Representatives, 
How do you foresee the next two years, the following two years, in terms of both legislation and investigations? Uh, and what impact will that have on voters? You have some Republican candidates now saying they want to impeach Joe Biden and people and a reporter says why. And they say, well, we'll get to that. Uh, so what do you think is going to happen? You know, Kevin McCarthy pretty well. I mean, that sounds like some things that Democrats were saying uh, coming out of the 2016 election. Right. Um, so what I would say is that Republicans nationally, um, particularly on the House side, have already said what they are going to be focused on. Um, they've made that commitment to America. Um, what do they want to do? They want to ease the financial burdens of Americans. They want to make sure that we're making our streets safer by funding over 200,000 more police officers uh, through recruiting and bonus structures. They want to give parents a voice when it comes to their children's education. And um, so those are some of the things that Republicans have said nationally that they will be focused on. And um, I think that those are the commitments that they've made that they will be focused on those things. I didn't see once in the commitment to America anything about impeachment. Stephanie? About what Republicans are going to be? Yeah, well, if the Republicans take the House, what's it going to be like? I mean, they're, they're you know, I think that uh, Kevin McCarthy is going to have a hard time controlling a lot of, of members in his caucus. Um, there are talks about impeachment, not so much of Joe Biden, but of members of his cabinet, which you technically can't. Um, there, you know, in that document that Republicans rallied around, there is, um, you know, protecting um, or uh, I can't exactly remember the language, Jessica, maybe you can, but it is um, about, you know, passing a national abortion ban. And we know on the Senate side, a bill has already been introduced to do that by Lindsey Graham. Uh, they have promised to overturn the Inflation Reduction Act, which means that um, drug prices for seniors would no longer be capped at $2,000 a year. It means that people wouldn't have savings on their energy bills. It means that um, on healthcare premiums, the subsidies, subsidies that were put in place years ago um, would go away and premiums would skyrocket. So these, you know, the, the details will really matter here. I know what it's like to put a campaign slogan out there and an agenda with no detail um, so that you're rallying the party around standing for something to try to keep the crazies at bay. I know what that's like. Uh, but when it comes to actually governing, um, it's very difficult. Um, to succeed in doing that, particularly with a caucus that, that what the Republican caucus is going to look like. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the voters that put these Republicans in office are going to demand, you know, their goods. <laughs> and that means banning abortion and overturning the Inflation Reduction Act and, um, and everything else. So they're going to have to figure out how to get that done without, you know, uh, really setting up a Democratic president for re-election, because that's essentially what it will do. So you just talked about re-election. So let me go to that, uh, because 2022 is going to have an impact on what happens in 2024. We have a number of candidates who adhere to the notion that the 2020 election was stolen. For example, the Republican gubernatorial candidate in Pennsylvania and Secretary of State candidates and governors who could be in charge of counting votes and certifying the contest in 2024. Stephanie, how dangerous do you think this is? And Jessica, do you even see it as a problem? Stephanie, you go first. It's incredibly dangerous um, that uh, people who think 2020 with no evidence, no evidence ever offered um, that the election was stolen. Um, and um, the other, and plenty of them are running for secretary of state, but also for higher office. Um, and um, a number of them, you know, either traveled to January 6th or had something to do with the January 6th um, insurrection. So if we thought that was bad, I don't think we've seen anything yet. The other thing that's hanging over all of this is the Supreme Court a uh, case that they've taken up and will hear arguments on, on the independent state legislature theory, which essentially allows 
um, state legislatures uh, to ignore the will of the people, ignore voters, and choose their own electors. Um, and that's, that's essentially what Trump tried to do um, in changing the electoral slates in Arizona and other states. Um, and you know, we'll see where that comes out in the Supreme Court. But if that, uh, if the conservative majority of the Supreme Court um, acknowledges that theory as a legitimate theory, which there's no basis in the Constitution, um, and the majority of the Republican Party doesn't believe it, um, then uh, it, it's going to be absolute chaos. Um, where you know, if you show up and you cast your vote for somebody, but the the the, uh, the people in the majority in the state legislature disagree with you and they can change the outcome of your vote. No, you know, imagine what that does to our democracy. Jessica, do you think that's a real risk? So I think what's a real risk? That you would have state legislatures substitute their own preferences for the majority of the will of the voters. I don't, I don't think that it is. Um, and I think that, you know, voters throughout the country are focused on those kitchen table issues. Um, it is a referendum year. And people are thinking about what they were paying for gas two years ago. People are thinking about how much it costs to fill up a cart of groceries. Um, people were thinking about whether or not they had to pay their electric bill on their credit card. Um, these are things that people are thinking about. They're thinking about, you know, women being mowed down by cars here in California and, you know, with their jogging stroller and the person getting a slap on the wrist and, and camp over the summer. Um, these are the things that voters are thinking about when they're going to the, the, the ballot box. And who's been in charge? Who's been responsible? And I know Democrats would love to talk about anything but their own record because their record has led us to this place. California Republicans, and I think Republicans around the country are talking about those issues. And Stephanie is absolutely right. They have to deliver on those goods once they get the opportunity to govern. None of this is given. It will be earned, though. You know, Jessica, you are great at staying on your message and not talking about 2024, but I'm going to ask each of you one more question about it. Uh, after the midterms, depending on how they turn out, uh, do you think Donald Trump will run again? And if not, who are the likely Republican candidates? And then for Stephanie, uh, who are the leading Democratic possibilities if Joe Biden doesn't run? Uh, you can start, Jessica. Yeah, so I think that anyone that tries to predict what President Trump will do uh, is in a losing battle. Um, this is a man who is his own man and he makes his own decisions. So the short answer is, I don't know. Um, I think that there's a lot of, I'm incredibly proud though of the bench that we have. Um, when, whether it's someone like Ambassador Nikki Haley, or uh, Governor DeSantis down in Florida. Uh, we've certainly seen um, former Vice President Mike Pence and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. These are all people that are looking at the race. Um, Senator Tim Scott, Senator Tom Cotton, um, Governor Kristi Noem. Um, these are incredible individuals, um, many of which have already had executive experience. Um, certainly people that understand the problems that um, states all over our country and our country are facing. Um, so should President Trump uh, decide not to run, um, I think that there'll be some great candidates to choose from on the Republican side. Stephanie? So um, I have no knowledge, no inside knowledge of whether President <laughs> is uh, running. Um, I think that he probably will. Um, and if he does, I think he'll have a pretty, uh, he'll have a clear field. If he doesn't, um, then obviously the vice president presumably would run. Um, I, but I do think you'll see some others get into the race as well. I don't know exactly who, but the names that are floating out there are, you know, potentially J.B. Pritzker, uh, the governor of Illinois, um, potentially the governor of California, uh, Governor Newsom. Um, I think maybe you'll pr probably see Senator Sanders run again. Um, you know, there's uh, talk um, if uh, Governor Whitmer comes out of her reelection uh, well, which it looks like she will, she could be a potential candidate. Um, and so there are a, a number of people um, who could step into the race, but there's a lot of, a lot of questions, uh, two key questions that have to get answered first. One is President Biden going to run? 
the expectation is that he will. Um, and if he doesn't, does um, the vice president um, get into the race? Uh, okay, I'm gonna turn to audience questions in one minute. But first, uh, can you each pick a race where you think we might be surprised on November 8th, or at least after the ballots are counted in the days following November 8th? Stephanie? I, well, can I, I'm going to pick two that I'm following closely. One is the Ohio Senate race between Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance. Nobody ever thought that Democrats would be competitive uh, in that race. Uh, and we're outraising, outworking um, uh, Republicans there significantly. And they just had a killer debate um, where Tim Ryan really, you know, um, you know, brought everything he had, did really well against J.D. Vance, um, you know, it's still Ohio. And Bob, you and I know Ohio. <laughs> it breaks your heart. <laughs> all the time. Uh, and, you know, the Republicans are, have a higher registration rate and, and all of that. However, uh, if anybody could do it, I think Tim Ryan could. It'll be an interesting one to watch. Um, and some of the key metrics, like he, you know, most of his money has been raised out of Ohio, small dollars, grassroots money across that state, where J.D. Vance is having fundraising problems and most of his money is coming from outside of the state. Um, the second one is North Carolina, um, uh, Bud versus Beasley. Um, and Beasley, the Democrat, former Supreme Court justice, um, uh, is holding her own in that race. And it's essentially statistically tied within the margin of error. Nobody ever thought we would be uh, in that tight of a race. Um, she's out raising, out working, um, uh, controlling the narrative. Um, she's been a star. So again, North Carolina is very tough for Democrats, very tough. Um, but uh, you know, it's been an interesting race to watch and one that I, I'm interested to see the outcome in. Jessica, what, what's your surprise? Well, I'm going to talk about two races, too. Um, I have to do one in California uh, because that's where most where most of my focus is. So uh, that race that I really want people to watch uh, is California 13. Uh, we have uh, farmer John Duarte, who is running northern part of the Central Valley. It's essentially an open seat. Um, I think we have a great opportunity there. We're seeing the Central Valley really become a battleground. Uh, in California, and that's exciting to watch. So John Duarte, California 13, would be my number one. Uh, the other race that, that I would like people to watch is um, what's happening in Indiana 1. Um, I had the opportunity to meet Jen Green, um, and she is probably most recently, some people would describe her as a survivor, uh, but she is way more than that. She is a force to be reckoned with, um, and I'm excited to watch Jen Green over in Indiana 1. Okay, let me turn to audience questions. First one to you, Jessica, and then Stephanie, you can comment on it. Will the immigration border crisis drive many voters next month? Republicans thought it would in 2018, but it never did. Yeah, so we're not seeing it um, very high on list of issues right now. Um, one of the things that is driving, though, um, that comes from the border crisis issue is the fentanyl um, crisis that we're seeing. Um, about 300 Americans are dying every day. Um, that's a plane crash. And if a plane was crashing every day, people would be really paying attention to it. I think here in California, I think we have 17 deaths a day. Um, I think, you know, Bob, I'm a mom. Um, I, my oldest just turned 10 last week. My youngest will be eight on Monday. And for the first time, I had to have a conversation with them about taking candy from strangers. And, um, you know, these colorful fentanyl pills that we're seeing out there, it's scary. Do I think that the likelihood that, you know, this will come in contact with my children, uh, I think it's very low. Um, but I don't want to be in that position where I didn't talk to them about what they should and shouldn't do. So do I think that it's going to be a huge driver? I think still the kitchen table issues. Uh, will be our biggest drivers. Um, but I think that it is out there for some people and maybe in different ways that we haven't seen before. Stephanie, you want to comment on that? Um, I mean, do I think it's going to impact the race? I think right. 
if it does, those people probably had made up their minds a very long time ago. Um, it is not a, um, an issue top of mind, I agree with Jessica, going into the final days. Um, you know, I think in 2018, uh, it was a little different, you know, kids in cages and things like that. It was sure it was an immigration issue, but it was um, a little bit more complex than that. Um, so. Okay, here's our next question. At what point, if any, do you feel the escalating war in Ukraine will play into the midterms? In other words, what has to happen in that war that could tilt the balance toward either Republicans or Democrats in the midterm results. Stephanie, you can go first this time. Um, tilting the balance. I mean, um, certainly, um, and, you know, knocking on wood, this doesn't happen. I hesitate to even say it, but an attack on the United States uh, or on American citizens abroad as a result of our position in that war um, could tilt the outcome. Um, but, uh, beyond that, um, you know, I guess, um, you know, the Putin's onslaught into Ukraine, where you come down on Putin, um, and which party is tougher on him could have an impact. But honestly, without something major at this point, um, we're, you know, three and a half weeks out. Um, it would have to be a significant development for it to impact the race. Jessica? I think that's about right. Uh, you know, when I think, it, uh, you know, foreign relations isn't my forte, but, you know, when President Biden was talking about, you know, possible nuclear, um, I think that's a very scary thought for people. Um, so I think it would have to be something significant um, for it to tilt the decision in any of these races. You, you mean when President Putin was talking about nuclear, and Biden responded, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, here's our next question. Polls tend to undercount younger voters who don't vote in as high a percentage as older age groups in midterm elections. Will this election have a larger youth voter turnout? And if so, what will that mean to the results? Jessica, you can go first. Well, I think that we do a really good job on the modeling side of things. Um, and if they undercount um, younger voters, there's a reason for that. Um, I don't know if that's going to change. Um, I don't know that that is that there are a lot of issues that are pushing younger voters out this particular election. Um, but historically, um, I think that with our modeling and our polling, um, we do a pretty good job of counting them on, on at least on our inside stuff. Uh, our next question. Oh, no, Stephanie, you want to talk about younger voters? Um, sure. So I think two issues, um, three issues could be motivating to younger voters. Um, again, uh, younger voters are not a monolithic body. It depends on where they are, who they're voting for, the races in which they're participating. Um, but I think the abortion issue, um, you know, um, uh, is weighing on them heavily. I think that um, President Biden's um, steps on relieving student debt uh, is a motivator. Uh, and I think depending upon uh, where you live and the issues in that race, I think climate change um, is a real motivator. Um, and if they, uh, but we also know that they do vote at lower rates in um, midterm elections. If they feel that uh, these two candidates um, or the two parties aren't really speaking to them or understanding where they are, they, they will just stay home. Jessica, I don't know if you're going to like this next question, but I'm going to ask it because uh, one of our uh, someone in our audience did. As the chair of the California Republican Party, do you feel that there's a rift between California Republicans and the National Party? Are there key differences and is there tension in leadership between the two bodies? So I'll take the end of that question first. There's definitely zero tension. I think that Chairwoman Ronna McDaniels has been an absolutely transformative leader of our party. Um, and so much of the things that she works on are, are goals that I had for our state. Um, for example, um, we have community engagement centers that we have opened all over the country. Um, the very first one was opened up in California in Little Saigon, and it focused on our Asian populations. And this isn't the typical campaign headquarters where we just launch precinct walks and make phone calls. 
Um, we do that too, but also, you know, a Vietnamese uh, preschool dance team practices there on Saturdays. You have legal help. Um, there is language help. Um, in some of our headquarters around the country, we've launched our Republican Civic Initiative, which has um, staff members that are trained by the State Department to help individuals um, who are studying for their citizenship uh, tests. Um, we've opened, since that, that headquarters in Little Saigon, we've opened two more headquarters, uh, RNC engagement centers that focus on the Latino communities. Um, we have one in Palmdale in Congressman Mike Garcia's district. We have one in Bakersfield in Congressman David Valadeo's district. Um, so this is something um, that was incredibly important to me. It was something that was a vision of our chairwoman, Ronna McDaniel. Um, also, uh, as a member of the RNC, um, I am one of you know the, the state party chairs. We each have a representative for each state and our, um, our US uh, territories as well. And I happen to serve at the appointment of the chairwoman as the chair of chairs. Um, I really couldn't ask for a better partnership with RNC leadership. Um, and everything that she and the RNC has invested in California, despite being a very blue state. Um, what I will say is that um, California Republicans, um, I'd like to say that we are a very broad and, and much like our state, a diverse group of people. And the way that I have always tried to lead is by welcoming people into our party and finding those, you know, 85% of things that we agree on and focusing on those issues. Um, there's too few of us in California to be exclusive. And I want to make sure that anyone who identifies as being a Republican feels welcome in our party here in California. Yeah, by the way, chair of chairs is quite an extraordinary title. I've never heard of it before. Uh, uh, Stephanie, I think this that might be a clo colloquialism. <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, a official title. Stephanie, you've mentioned this before, so this is for you. Uh, and Jessica, you can comment if you want. Uh, Will the January 6th committee findings, the investigations of Donald Trump, uh, the search of Mar-a-Lago, all of that have an impact on the midterm outcome? I Again, I think um, it could on the margins, just to remind people he's still out there. Um, but I don't think it will, it's certainly not going to cause a wave on either side. Um, but in the margins, it just minds pockets of matters that he is still looming we're still dealing with the you know crap <laughs> that he uh shed upon us um and that there's a threat that he could come back and that uh for democratic voters uh is certainly a motivator but for swing voters um it's something that was certainly from prior years has tilted them towards democrats um, but again, in the, the tight race that we're in, um, you know, if the race were held today, um, I, you know, it, it, this, this would be a marginal issue. Uh, Jessica, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think when people are, you know, behind on their electricity bills and they're deciding, you know, whether or not they're going to fill up their tank of gas or, you know, buy that extra bag of chips at the store, um, I don't think that this is something that is really weighing on them or pushing people out to vote. Um, when you're worried about getting to your Walgreens before it closes, because it closes four hours earlier, um, because the crime has gotten so bad in your city. That's not what people are worried about. They're worried about those kitchen table issues. Jessica, a lot of message discipline in every answer. <laughs> uh, somebody I answered in, that. <laughs> you, you, you guys have talked about this. Uh, people will be voting with their wallets in November. Uh, and many, like myself, the questioner says, aren't quite sure what party will better benefit our investments in day-to-day -day inflation costs. Could we each give a brief answer to this, maybe, and tell us who you think, why people should trust the Democrats or the Republicans to deal with this inflation problem? You want to go first, Steph? Sure. Um, I would say that um, historically, the economy is always better with a Democrat in charge. Uh, that is a fact. Um, and that there is only one party who's rolling up their sleeves to try to do something about it. And the truth is, uh, presidents and uh, ruling parties can do very little about inflation, um, considering it's a, it's a global uh, phenomenon that we're facing right now. 
um, with many countries much worse off than the United States. Um, but uh, looking generally about how to reduce costs on middle class families, uh, one party is taking action on it and the other one is standing in the way. Um, and, uh, you know, and has promised to, to undo the things that, um, that we've done to, to reduce their, <clears throat> their energy costs, their healthcare costs, their prescription drug costs, et cetera. Jessica, I can't imagine what you're going to say to this. <laughs> Realities are what we're living right now. Um, Democrats have been in charge. And we've seen those costs go up. Here in California, we're paying $6.29 a gallon for gas on average. Um, we're paying $2.37 above the national average. Um, all the Democrats are in charge of every uh, legislative body and the governor's seat. Um, we've seen that here in California. And the realities are people are gonna know who's in charge and what it was like before they were in charge. Um, so these are, are, I think, you know, good for Republicans. I think when you think of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which, you know, most nonpartisan analysts said it would do nothing to reduce inflation. You know, what do we see? We saw 87,000 new IRS agents that were put into place. For perspective, we currently have 80,000 IRS agents. What do you think those people are going to be doing? Um, they're looking at getting more tax dollars from the taxpayers. Um, so I, I don't think that Americans and certainly not Californians are going to be trusting um, Democrats to help them with cost of living and the problems that we've been facing under Democrat and one party rule. Stephanie, you have any response to that? Don't we want people to pay their taxes? I mean, <laughs> you know, I, guess. I would love to meet someone who doesn't think they're paying enough in taxes. But most uh, I think most people would agree that they want their their neighbors to be paying their taxes because they do. Um, and I get why Republicans are using it. I get the fear factor, but if that's their winning argument, it's, I don't think it'll hold up. But well, we'll see. Let me, let me, you, 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 you disagree, but, but you do it rather civilly. I have one last quick question. I think this is for you, Stephanie. Uh, uh, do Democrats focus too much on low on the list issues that don't concern most Americans? Does the party need more uh, Kahanas and Buddha judges, or does it need more culture warriors like AOC and Omar? I, I mean, I don't, I'm gonna need a little bit more on what you think are those issues that are lower down on the list. Um, so. Well, I, I think people are talking about identity issues. Yeah. So identity politics. Right. So what is identity politics? Is identity politics um, women who want freedom over their own bodies? Um, or is it, you know, white men who fear, um, you know, the other, um, you know, overtaking this country? What is identity politics? Because that word is thrown around um, very literally, no pun intended, but both sides play identity politics. That's what politics is actually about. Um, if you're talking about like transgender bathrooms and things like that, um, you know, I don't know, and this has nothing to do with my beliefs on that issue, but I don't know of one candidate out there that's running on transgender bathrooms. The people who are running on cultural issues are actually Republicans of, uh, you know, not wanting our true history to be taught in classrooms of, you know, uh, the don't say gay law in Florida. Those are the cultural issues that are injected into our politics and they're injected into our politics by Republicans. And the majority of American people, you're right, they are low on the, on the totem pole of issues. Um, but, uh, you know, because, you know, they are figuring out how they're gonna get their kids to school, put gas in their car and everything else. Um, but make no mistake, um, you know, identity politics is played by both sides. And right now we're talking about those cultural issues that Republicans have injected into the discourse. And those are not for you, Jessica, big issues here in California. No. Okay. Listen, you, this has been a terrific conversation and it's easy for our audience to see, I think, why both of you have had such an impact on the politics of your respective parties. So I want to thank you for this discussion. 
I want to thank everybody who tuned in and who asked questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. Uh, I hope to see a lot of you uh, on the next program of the Center for the Political Future on October 25th on abortion in the Supreme Court, politics over law or law over politics. Thank you all very much. Have a great day and a great rest of the week.